So in this data science project series, we are going to look into this MNIST uh, project. We will be concerned with the binary classification. We already looked at uh, one of these data sets like in, in the form of a Titanic, but this is the second problem. Um, so for any classification project, you can think of uh, the structure can be briefly formatted in this way. So when you are given a data, you are going to look into the history and the context of the data. If it's given from the business, you are going to look at you know, what this data comes from, you know, how do they generate it to have understanding how this data comes from. And then after you have it for the purpose of modeling and prediction, we are going to look into various things like data properties, how much missing data is there, what is the distribution of each of those variables. How can we split the data set? Do should we split by some kind of a strategy? or just random split or what data transformations we need to do if it, the distributions are somehow skewed, maybe we want to convert them into, um, into normal distributed distribution-like transformation. And then you have feature engineering um, where you're going to uh, incorporate, uh, or I, it, it's a, uh, you, you look at all the variables and try to come up with some new variables that might explain a little bit more uh, for your model. And then the pipeline is essentially all the transformations uh, handling missing data, all of them could be constructed in the form of a pipeline. Um, and then models, like there are several classification models all the way from logistic regression to SGD classifier to um, to neural networks, to regression uh, tree, uh, decision trees, and so on. So we could we could apply one of those models here. And then performance metrics. This is the most critical part of any classification problem. To understand how to uh, how the model works, you look into accuracy, precision recall, and ROC, etc. Important. So un having a clear understanding of these metrics is really important. Um, when he, given the context of the data, when is precision important? When is recall important? And uh, there is another metric called F1, uh, which is a com uh, combination of these two, precision and recall. So, so when you understand the context of the problem, we you know which metric is more important, right? So in some cases, for example, if you want to be, let's say, punishing a criminal, you want to make sure that, that the criminal that you're saying criminal is actually truly did some uh, crime, right? You, you don't want to punish an innocent. So in that case, the precision is very important. Um, in case of, let's say, there are cancer survivors, uh, cancer, some people who are in fact, who are suffering from cancer, you want to detect them. In that case, recall is very important. You don't want to miss anybody. So in making those choices, you are actually um, understand, you have to get some insight from the problem itself, right? So that's how you choose whether precision is important or recall is important. And there are ways to adjust those uh, based on some, the thresholds. Uh, we will look into this a li little bit detail later on. But uh, choosing which metric is important is becomes crucial in most of the binary classification problems. And then we look at error analysis. This is where you do the predictions and then sometimes you do predictions that are supposed to be one class but are other class, right? So you take some samples of that, that particular mispredicted uh, classes and uh, instances and then you look at why are those the way they are? Is there anything that we can do at, about it? So that may help us uh, do some feature engineering or maybe explore get more data or generate more data based on existing data and so on. So this is error analysis. And then the next step is some things that we can do, um, which I am not presenting here is how do you productionalize the data? How do you improve the training data set? Uh, what are the business needs? Did we satisfy or not? So those are some questions that we like. This, so this is a general outline of a binary classifier. So to begin with, uh, you know, I'm maintaining a structure where I have my project and within the project there is a data science data folder and there is a notebooks folder and there is an image folder. 
so i am creating this one uh, and then if there are other utility files i am using some some utilities so i am just incorporating this particular utility files in the path so that when i'm using the notebook i don't run into problems so this is the way to incorporate so this is general uh, project structure and once uh, i have the project structure i'm tr i'm going to fetch this data from uh, this mnist data from using this uh, fetch open ml so let's let's look at what is uh, mnist data right so so you can look at the wikipedia it's a it's a data it's a data the source is national institute of standards and technology data database these are essentially handwritten digits you can see this in this image and we are trying to identify based on each of these image we are trying to identify what would be the the equivalent numerical value right so people can write uh, different letters in different for example four can be written this way or four can be written this way so we we are trying to build a model that predicts uh, whether this image is four or not but actually in this case uh, we are converting this whole thing this is a multi classification problem example but we are converting this whole problem into a a binary classification where we are trying to predict whether the model predicts five or not whether this image is five or not right so in this case it, it all of these will be not and this this particular row will be one everything else will be zero so that's the binary classification that we are going to do in a later project i can we can do multi classification so although there are neural network methods that can be applied uh, i'm not going to do this in this one and uh, that will be for another project as well so this is the history of the data set we are trying to recognize each of this image as what numerical number it is so <coughs> so if we go back i'm i'm fetching data from this package fetch open ml so what that package does is that it's actually a new uh, package from sk learn uh, as far as i know so you can can look at it this is the uh, this is particular sk data sets that fetch ml right so um these are all the methods so this is still experimental in the in the sense that uh, not every data set is standardized yet but you can look at some of the data set that you can see so you can see here there are certain data sets like for example toy data set you know boston iris diabetes digits uh, wine and breast cancer these are some toy data sets that you can uh, get into your jupyter notebook right so using this command uh, some of them are deprecated but you can see that what it has inside it we have written x y uh, sometimes these are not as standard as it, it can be uh, so in all of these cases i think it it returns x y as a data frame uh, there are other data sets like uh, news group news group web tries and, uh, and and so on right so and some are, some of these are generating uh, some artificial data based on our needs and some others are uh, here you can see uh, different files we can we can do other data sets as well so this is a useful package if you just want to quickly test run some tests so you can use a uh, open fetch uh, data set so let's uh, so within that like i have two lines of code here this one is actually the code that fetches the data so this particular package name um, data set name is mnist 784 and the version is 1 so as soon as i fetch it i'm using this uh, job lib to dump the data set as mnist.pickle because if i run this notebook multiple times i don't want to fetch from the internet because this is a really relatively decent size so it's best if i read from local so i i wrote this additional code rather than just using this single line of code right and then you have this data properties so now if i look at this xy let's let's look at display x what is written here you have pixel 1 to all the way to pixel 784 um and uh, and you can see what actually this pixel represents you can you can this is an array right so if you take this particular first row 
and then you try to plot it it is this is how uh, it will look like so this is an image and we are just uh, looking at uh, it's a 28 by 28 and then we are looking at each of the pixel value whether it is zero or um, uh, or, or anyway it can range because it's a colored one it can range from zero to 255 So that, that's essentially what this data set is. And then the why is uh, whether um, the number is, the, the number that is represented here is the number, right? You can see that the number from one to nine, zero to nine actually. So these are all the possible values for it. We, we are, although this is the data set, we are going to convert them into binary classification problem by trying to uh, convert all fives to one and uh, uh, remaining ones as zero. So um, also this is some useful um, uh, conversion technique. So when you look at the data, the data itself, it can be a, a string. In this case, it is string. So we are converting into uh, a, a number. Uh, also, I'm looking at if there are any rows that are, that are missing. And uh, you can see that there is there are no rows missing so we don't need to do any missing data handling uh, and then uh, if you look at the stats so each of them have uh, various values and it looks like the boundary values or the bound boundary pixels are uh, all zero between them no data in them but as you go to the towards the end some of them have some value uh, for some numbers I guess but uh, in between I'm, I'm sure that the values will be anywhere from um, 0 to 255. Um, <coughs> so this is uh, another way of displaying. I'm displaying a few indices uh, from the array. I'm taking them and converting them into uh, 28 by 28. And once I have this array, if I pass them into I am show image, it will plot and I'm plotting various numbers and uh, this all of this code mostly is to, to lay these images in a, in a row. Um, so then I can split this training data. So there are no unique features in this one, all of them are pixel values. So there's a lot of feature engineering that you can do. Um, we, are, we are not doing it here, but can we imagine any pixel? Uh, can we imagine any feature engineering? based on these pixel values. You can maybe, you can probably, uh, you know, do the sum of these values and come up with some numbers uh, in, in this box, for example. Uh, each box could represent, uh, the sum of the pixel values within that box can be another feature that can be used to do some analysis later. So, but I'm not doing any of that stuff right now, but you can be creative, like, you know, you, know, you can cre split this whole image into like one, two, three, four, five, six parts, and say what is the sum of this particular row, sum of this row and this row and so on. And that value could indicate, can be useful. So, so that's a feature engineering exercise that you can do. Also do column sums, that's a feature engineering. But in this particular project, we are not going to do it. Um, it will take too long. So the first thing is to, uh, so in this case, there are many ways of splitting data set. This data is already shuffled. Uh, so I'm going to take um, the first 6,000 rows as a training data set, and then the remaining ones as a test data set. So this is one way of uh, splitting the data into two parts, training and test. The other ways we have seen train test bits. So this will uh, randomly pick 20% uh, of the data into testing and the remaining ones into training. If you want to do stratified splitting, so you can put this stratify is equal to Y. So because we know that number of Y, um, each one have, if, if you want equal representation of number of Y's, uh, similar to a training the test, this is this is the strat strategy that we can use. A random may miss this the numbers, but, but stratify can make sure that it has this so we, we now create a binary class using this code, uh, y train and x train, and then we do modeling. So the modeling I'm using SGD classifier. So with a log loss, this is equal to a logistic regression. So why is, uh, there are many ways of uh, modeling or constructing or uh, solving a model. So we have a real life uh, 
process that generates this data, right? People write on some notes and take images, that's a real process. Whereas a model is trying to, uh, in a way, it come up with some way of getting the same outcome as that process does. It may not resemble it, but that's the process. So the model, it can be a, like a logistic regression where you can compute those values doing some metrics inversion. Uh, or you can do subspacing like in decision trees where you, uh, you look at subspaces and each you assign each of the possible spaces into um, value whether it is uh, one or zero. So that's a decision tree process. But SGD is involves constructing a loss function uh, and then you're trying, and there are parameters that, that creates a model. So you're adjusting the model while you're trying to uh, go through the, uh, like it's in a gradient descent process, you're trying to go through the parameter space, uh, trying to minimize it. And while, while moving through the parameter space, uh, you, you are adjusting your weight parameters. So that's a SGD classifier. This will be more dominant in the case of neural networks where um, your approach to solve or to estimate the parameters is uh, a gradient descent or versions of gradient descent. So in this case, we are going, we can use a gradient descent classifier log loss, which amounts to using logistic regression. So here I am fitting, uh, fitting, uh, using this uh, SGD classifier dot fit. And then I am looking at one example, I'm taking the test data set and I'm asking it to predict here. So it says it's zero. And then if I do, I can do cross validation score and estimate uh, within the training data set, uh, the values, right? So you can see, and uh, the validation score, when the metric is accuracy, you can see that this is, uh, 0 0.958, 0 0.959, and so on. So in order to do comparison, how well this is doing, we can actually build a naive uh, model, which says, it's a, if you ask me whether this digit is five or not, I can close my eyes and say it's not five, because the proportion of data is maybe five to 10%. So you will be accurate about 95, 90 to 95% of the time, right? So because you can just say, it's not five, it's not five. Right? So that's essentially uh, this particular and uh, code. And uh, this is important one to build your own code so that it, 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 fit, it fits into the paradigm of predict and fit. And you know you have all these functions when you use this space estimator. So you're defining what is fit and what is predict. So the predict is saying zero, everything uh, is, is not five, right? And again, if I do, uh, a cross validation score with a scoring of accuracy, you see that the accuracy is actually 0.95. Right now we get into a performance metrics. This is one of the most uh, important part of this uh, project. When you, whenever one is doing a classification problem to understand uh, these metrics. So first we can look at how our model is performing. We can take our confusion matrix and uh, we can compute a confu confusion matrix which says these are correctly predicted non five and these are correctly predicted five and uh, these are wrongly predicted right so so let's look at uh, what these are um, in uh, so so what we plotted just now is uh, this particular um, square. You have actual predictions, uh, you have actual value, and you have predicted values. Then you're counting the number of times the actual value equal to the predicted value, and that's true positive, right? And number of times the actual value is negative and the predicted is also negative, right? That's true negative. This is actual value is positive and predicted value is true positive. And this one is actual wa value is positive, but you predicted it as negative. That's type two error, right? And then type one error is actual value is negative, but you're saying it's a positive. So this type one and type two 
are actually important when you're making the call about like in, in the case of for example uh, punishing a, a criminal right so you want to make sure that he is a criminal so you and then uh, are detecting cancer right so depending on e which case it is you, you are mostly focused on minimizing type 1 error or type 2 error right now um, the other way of looking at is also um, precision and recall so there are many measures here but we will be looking at this particular box and also two other ones precision uh, which is true positives by true positive plus false positive right so true positive uh, total number of the proportion of true product true positives in the positives that I predict and then uh, the other one is recall and this one is also proportion of true positives in the actual number of positives that we have so these are the two m important ones um, depending on the domain that you are in for example if you go into bio uh, biology domain uh, their sensitivity specificity um, are, are more important that, uh, so we like you know here defines uh, what is specificity and uh, I think there is also a definition of sensitivity here so all of these are important in a con different context but for this particular part we are going to mostly look into precision and recall there is another score called F1 uh, which is um, harmonic mean of precision and recall so we are going to compute all of these and uh, in our particular data set so it's very it fairly straightforward so you have all these functions you have precision score recall score f1 score and accuracy score so you need to give the input it takes is what your predictions are and what your true values are once you give those it, it can compute all of these you can see that the accuracy is 0.96 for our model and the precision and recall are uh, 0.84 and 0.66 uh, respectively and f1 score is uh, these values so here I am plotting the y scores so these are the behind the scenes values that make the decision about whether this is a 5 or not 5 so you can see the our function uh, this SGD CLF function internally calculate some value and these are the, all the values that it came up with and then it's saying that at certain point I am going to draw a line and say values that are greater than let's say negative 0.70 is 5 and which are less than negative 0.7 uh, negative 70 uh, 7011923 they are considered to be not 5 so so we have some room to decide which ones will be 5 which ones are not 5 so these are thresholds and we can manipulate this threshold to increase our precision uh, or or increase our recall so that um, where do we do that is decided by what is known as a precision recall curve so you can see for each of the threshold value we are printing what is the precision and what is the recall so we are going all the way from negative um, 2.6 to the power of 0 0.6 to oh, all the way to 8.9 to the power of 5 right so positive so we are changing the threshold and calculating precision and recall of our model so and then you can see the performance uh, as the uh, performance uh, uh, changes this way if we, if we, uh, so we can plot it and maybe we can choose our precision to be 0.8 where the recall is also 0.8 and maybe the, so th that may be the point where we are ideally located we can then choose that particular threshold where we are happy with the precision and recall right so at this point for example we are happy with the precision and recall Another uh, way of judging the model is ROC curve. Uh, you can l look at the false positive rates and true positive rates, and then you can plot on the uh, right hand side false positive rate, sorry, on the x axis and on the y axis true positive rate. If it is a general model, 
something that predicts half the time true and half the time false yeah you have uh, you will get this straight line whereas if the model is accurate your predictions um, may depending on a threshold you, you can have your false positive rate and it can mm, uh, true positive rates on this curve so this one actually says so we are accurate most we are doing better than this line by this much of the time so if the curve can go all the way here then it's actually better so that's what this roc curve says and you can do that plotting using this particular function so we can try another model and then the random forest and compare against the st classifier so i did not do any parameter tuning any grid search or anything just look at this default values and do the uh, predictions you can see that uh, my roc score is 0.993 whereas uh, So compared to SGD, the random forest uh, plot goes up, which means that random forest classifier is doing better than our uh, SGD classifier. So this ROC curve can help determine that. So I think it, it it, when we go through the whole thing, we can uh, we can safely say that. Uh, random classifier, forest classifier is performing better than SGD with even with default parameters. So maybe if you want to productionalize, maybe we can use this uh, classifier than the SGD. We can evaluate many of those like KNN, SVM and so on and come up with the best model that explains your model and you can put it into production. But this is just a comparison uh, of SGD and uh, random forest classifier. We're going to then look at error analysis so we already looked at the confusion matrix where uh, there is a predicted value which is zero, the uh, actual value is zero and the predicted value is zero is 90% 90, 90 of the cases, right? Actual value is one, whereas the predicted value is one in, in 5.33 cases. Um, in this case, uh, the ones that we, where we are making type one and type two errors are the, these two. So we can look at uh, and do some analysis, try to understand where we are, why we are making these mistakes, why the model is making the mistakes. So that kind of analysis where we try to understand why this section is happening, why this section is happening, uh, is error analysis. So you can see in this case, uh, we are, reading this our predictions from the train type and uh, train prediction actual values and predicted value we are loading into this uh, da data frame uh, uh, making the data frame as prediction results and within that prediction results we are saying whenever the actual is not equal to prediction and taking that so that is the error data and further we are splitting the error data where our actual is one whereas our pre and predicted is zero right so that is error one and then uh, we are taking uh, error zero, where our actual is zero, but we are predicting it as um, one. And we are trying, it, so this is the data set that we have, and we are doing analysis of error one. So in this case, each of the image is five, right? Actual values are five, whereas our predictions are not five. You can see in some cases, uh, uh, you know, this five is not complete. So maybe that's why our model is not able to predict and this five doesn't looks like a one. Uh, this five looks, but maybe it, it conflicts with three, maybe, right? So, so these are the reasons why it's not performing um, as well as it could. And these are the images. Maybe this image is really bold, so most pixels have some value, so it's not so sure. Uh, it might be confusing with other digits. So uh, what, and we can then look at these and, and uh, think about you know what other models can we do can we do some enhancement of this image <coughs> and uh, come up with so that's uh, essentially the uh, error analysis right um, so the, the other part is you know where it's not 
five. Like you know, all of these are not fives, but our model is thinking this is five, and we have to understand why. Maybe the pixels uh, that are filled gives an impression that it's a five. Uh, maybe you know this one looks probably more closer to five. It's a two, but for the model, it probably thinks it's more closer to five. So uh, this one has some uh, some additional pixels filled from beyond three, and this one is seven, but it's not placed properly, and this one is six. It looks like a U. So it's uh, the model is confused how to classify these, and it wrongly classified as five. So these are the all the steps that are involved in doing uh, a, a classification problem, and. Uh, if you think about what are the things that we do in a classification in a real project, right? So how do you, you know, the, some questions to ask ourselves is how do you productionize this model? So one thing, you know, then you should ask the business, you know, how are people submitting? Are they submitting a converted values or, you know, are they posting it on the web? So you can, you can probably convert an image to this 28 by 28 and then convert them into numbers and then we can load into this model, right? So that's where numbers uh, an array and uh, are you providing an, a way to upload the data? So th we did not look into this, but this is definitely one thing that we, we can do. We can scale uh, values. The zero to 255 can now become um, anywhere from zero to one. We can have uh, a variance as one, a standard scaling can be done. Uh, can we improve uh, that our training data set? So we can definitely do that. I think when we look into neural networks, uh, we can we will see how to generate additional data from these images. So what we can do is like we can take each of those pixel values and shift it by either upwards or right side or left side or you know below or some angle. We can change the angle of each of those um, values or and then and then we. You know, we can add additional pixels, you know, fill neighbor, uh, and then so, you know, wherever this is there, we can actually extend it or remove uh, this image, for example, we can make it as a, a slim image. So that way we can extend the number of, uh, by, by doing some transformations, we can increase the number of data sets and that may help improve the prediction accuracy. So that's definitely something that can be done. So moving, moving pixels in XY direction. You can try other models. So some deep neural network models, convolutional models, for example, could really work really well. Um, some extensions of this, you know, we just looked at a binary classification, but uh, in future projects, we can look at multi-class multi classification, what are the things that we need to consider. And multi-label classification or uh, prediction. So in this case, for example, if you are asking two questions, whether the number is odd and whether the number is greater than five, for example. <coughs> so in that case, we are generating two values as an output, and that's a multi multi label. Whereas multi classification is you have uh, you have nine ten classes here from zero to ten nine, and then you're trying to put your data points in each of those bins. So that's a multi class. And uh, what you what to do if the data set is completely unbalanced, right? So. This be a project for that. Uh, uh, that will be another project that uh, we can look into. Uh, 